here for things that are flying insects and for um, and for birds obviously you have a really easy transit between these little pods of more natural vegetation and this area here I will say that this is really neat because along the building here with they've got a combination of structure water and native plants they do have some non-natives mixed in but they also allowed volunteers so here's Indian hemp which is apocynum it's one of the it's a very common milkweed relative and it's actually used by a lot of uh, insects to, as a food source for both pollinator you know the, the actual nectar as well as eating the plant it's toxic to other organisms by the way and it was one that was va uh, highly valued by Native Americans because they would break it up and they would actually use the inner bark for cordage it was a very prized cordage material but it's, an, it's a good example of things will volunteer, let them volunteer. So if people are willing to do that, I know some places they want to have it look more manicured, but other places maybe they can just let it go. And you may have remnants that are left. Look for moss, look for areas that have signs of being a more stable system like uh, Betsy was talking about under trees where you could have, as Rod describes, a freedom garden where you've got um, lots of mosses, you'll tend to have poverty oats grass, and uh, maybe things like bluets, those are wonderful things to build off of. And they probably have a nice soil structure that's been retained, and they've got rooting mass probably from trees underlying it all. So that would work really well. But so any combination where you can build, um, kind of build that structure, I will say that when you get complaints about snakes and things, um, having a lot of material up against the base of the house is if people are freaked out about that that's where snakes will sometimes hide out because they'll get all the warmth off the building black rats and other snakes are ectotherms so they have to warm up and when you have the building absorbing all that heat and you've got all that cover plus that's where the mammals might be they're going to eat so you might want to think about you know saying that well you want wildlife but try to put the, the structure the wildlife likes where you want the wildlife to be to a degree if you're not comfortable with things coming up right around your house, maybe move it off the house a little bit, keep more of an herbaceous barrier with maybe shrubs or trees a little bit taller, and then move the, the bigger shrubs out away from the foundation. That might help out. And then create those clusters and nodes around the yard. So, and then again, just trying to get a nice assemblage of native species, whether it's tree, shrub, and, and herbaceous in different zones. So trying to look at, um, the, the concept of having a green wall or some type of arbor where vines can climb is a wonderful concept. Uh, I think the thought here was they would bring nature into the building and they also get energy savings because when it, the leaves you know, um, are shading the building in the summertime, they're actually reducing the heat gain. And in the wintertime, the leaves die back and you'll, you'll increase heat gain so you get a heating um, benefit. Um, one negative I will say on this, there's, there's two things I would, I would say that they do have a high percentage of this when you come back in the summer is actually oriental bittersweet so it's an invasive vine uh this is actually no this is actually trumpet vine no, oh oh yes that's it right there yeah there's a whole bunch of it so you've got an invasive vine that's covering quite a bit of the building the good news is if you want to control it <clears throat> all you have to do is trace it back to the root cut the root and paint the root with garlon or triclopyr it's a brush killing herbicide and you just paint it right on the cut stump but you have to do it pretty quickly and you want to do it when it's actually got leaves on it because it's sending energy back to the root then uh, if you don't do it when it's got do it when, it, do it when it's dormant it's not going to necessarily kill the roots but that way you could manage it pretty easily just selecting which ones you want so I think the concepts really cool and you see readily Virginia creeper trumpet honeysuckle and trumpet vine all readily grow up anything you put for them to grow on. And Virginia creeper in particular is so common. Um, of course, poison ivy might not be your preference for growing up there. <laughs> trumpet honeysuckle is gorgeous, and I've, I've, grown, I've grown all three of those, and they grow really well on the arbors and other things. That's beautiful, yeah, that's another one. If you can get, if you can get it. It does. Yeah. Although if you had some fruit to go, Right. The only other thing I would suggest is, is that in, when you're mimicking a natural system, if you look at this lawn that's behind behind you, nature doesn't really do horizontal and vertical and sharp grade changes. It actually does, it, it has a, it's a gradual change. So it's usually brushier on the edges. So uh, it gives it more cover. 
So if you're able, if you want to do something like this with an arbor, it'd be kind of nice to have some shrub zones or herbaceous plants that are in beds kind of around the edges of it and then have the vines coming up in the middle. That gives it a nice layered effect. It gives multiple places for animals to live and hide and forage. What were the herbicides you mentioned? Well, for brush, the one that actually is usually very effective is triclopyr. And the, the one um, product that's the Monsanto product is Garlon, but there are other ones brush be gone. You're just looking for a triclopyr uh, that's in a dose, you know, a rate that will kill the, the woodies. And the, the cut and paint method is really good because it's, it's locally applied. It just kills that root system and then it degrades and it doesn't go anywhere. Does it work so. on um, bush honey and stuff? Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a really good thing for that too. Yeah, and, um, so that one we use a lot. They use it in a couple different methods. One's cut and paint and there's hack and squirt. Basically the same thing. You hack the vine, you have a little squirt gun, and you just squirt it. And then what you can do is you can look for the product versions that don't have the oil surfactant so the oils are what are aquatically uh, problematic so if they happen to wash somewhere it's the oil that usually affects the aquatic organisms and not necessarily the chemical itself most of those chemicals are salts so um, if you're applying them in small quantities and locally applying them they're not going to have that big of an effect because you're not doing it over a long term it's a very targeted application um, so in that case, like the brush begone, on the triclopyr, and it's Garlon 3A is the water-based version. And uh, Garlon, Garlon 4 is the one you'd want to avoid if you're concerned about water and moving in the water. And then the same thing happens with glyphosate. Glyphosate's very effective, but it's the um, glyphosate Roundup, or Roundup version, which has an oil-based surfactant that's aquatically unsafe, but the Aquanite, uh, or rodeo versions are the water-based versions and they have they they don't have the oil in it so they, it's much safer and just on that note if people are concerned about chemicals I think the problem is is that usually when people object they're reading about um, large-scale chemical applications awfully in agricultural situations where the people are unprotected you have bare soils they're spraying massive quantities over a lot of period of time over large areas but when you're doing targeted application on a shrub or you know whether it's foliar or on a like you know locally generally speaking if it's done well it's dry in 30 minutes it doesn't move and it's not toxic to organisms directly and it does degrade pretty quickly in the soil so it's just that targeted application and doing it when the conditions are right but sometimes it's your best friend because there's some things you cannot control by hand mm -hmm. so I've, I've had a question about the pre-emergent yes I'm not as familiar with those, so I won't give any any advice on those. Uh, I know some people use them. Uh, I know the one thing is to be concerned with is that it does, as far as I know, it inhibits most seed germination. So as long as it's active, it's going to suppress natives as well as non-natives. So you just have to be cognizant of that. And I would talk with some about someone about whether or not it's more of a specific or more more of a general application, um, you know, herbicide. And what do you use on lesser celandine, and is it too late? Oh, so lesser celandine, to control that chemically, actually, well, there's a couple things. Um, right now, we're using glyphosate. We're using it, um, obviously, since it's growing in places that flood, mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about rain. Uh, again, if you're using a water-based um, you know, glyphosate and you spray it directly on the um, lesser celandine, mm -hmm. It actually can be very effective and it won't move because it dries in about 30 minutes. And you're not having the oil-based uh, component in there. Plus, it's one of the only things out right now. So you can effectively target just the lesser celandine. Mm -hmm. Now remember, it's a tough plant to control. The other thing a friend of mine has done, um, she actually experimented with flame, um, killing it with flame. And they, they sell propane guns. You can buy them online or in like Home Depot sometimes. And it, you have a screw-in propane canister, you light it with a lighter, and you walk around and you burn the lesser celandine. <laughs> and for so small bad. patchy areas, that can be effective. Uh -huh. It can actually retard the, the growth for, for a while. Get well, it does, that's the big thing you have to watch, is usually for those, anything like that, you're looking at a combination of a seed bed and or roots. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to do multiple applications over time mm -hmm. and to, in order to exhaust the, uh, the seed source and or the roots. Um, and the other thing about that then is, is where's the source? Mm -hmm. 
So how's it getting to the site? In most cases, now there are unfortunately multiple species of lesser celandine. Mm -hmm. There are those that are more aquatic and those that are more upland. And I'm not sure if it's actually species or maybe just subspecies, mm -hmm. but there are all over the place. Mm -hmm. I've begun to see um, the types that grow in uplands. So it's not just a floodplain issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's not too late in the plants. Like Perfect time to get it. They're all green, so zap them now. Yeah, get them before everything else explodes. Mm -hmm. It's a good time to get it right now. Yeah, next few weeks is a really good time. This comment that, you know, these areas here, National Wildlife Federation did a very intentional um, effort to try to plant in native plants and provide habitat for wildlife. They've got a bunch of rain gardens that are in the parking lots that treat stormwater runoff. They do it in a really nice way. They, they do it in series. So it goes in the rain gardens, it's filtered. That water then, the, what makes it through goes down to a pond below where that water feature is. So they get multiple stages of treatment. Now on the planting, they did put native plants in. They also allowed things to volunteer. Um, I will say that there are some things that have volunteered like autumn olive which you want to get that stuff out. So if you have areas you're leaving, I would highly suggest controlling invasives that A, produce a lot of seed that are problematic and can be spread, but B, um, autumn olive is actually allelopathic, so it uses chemicals to suppress plants around it. So you're gonna limit plant growth if you have those species. And there are a few natives that do that, such as black walnut, but um, so that's notoriously difficult to grow things under. Also, uh, American beech is, um, it uses structural allelopathy. It actually uses its root system to prevent, to crowd other things out. But with the non-native invasives, I would really think about things like autumn olive as a, a highly problematic species. So I would try to remove those from the landscape where you see them. And again, cut and paint. Like right now, it's starting to leaf out. Probably within the next month, be a great time to cut and paint it. Because it'll be actively sending <coughs> sugars back down to the roots. Uh, yes, Bradford pear is another good one to cut and paint. As soon as it, it's already, they're leafing out now, so give it about another month and go at it. Get those things out of the landscape. Another thing I was going to point out, which I think is kind of neat, when it comes to Bradford pear, another good example, if you're bold enough to suggest they kill that tree in their lawn, you know, please do it because you can tell them why. But the other thing I think that um, we're tr starting to work on this on county facilities for Fairfax is the importance of, rep of the replacement. If you're walking around their lawn, maybe you don't have to revolutionize their entire yard, but talk about the things that are already aging out. The Bradford pear split notoriously. It's going to be pretty ugly at some point. Perfect opportunity to kill that invasive, get it out of there, and put a native tree in its place. So maybe it's a, it's a situation of where you're phasing out those uh, non-natives and phasing in the natives. And, and again, not all non-natives are bad. and People have things they love, and you don't want to shove it shove it down their throat that they can never have a non-native plant, it's the invasives we're most concerned with. But every time you can replace a non-native with a, a native, you're increasing your habitat value. Now, uh -huh. I've heard somebody say that they were going to do um, like a bounty program on Bradford Pear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't heard that. Haven't All heard I know, heard well, in North Carolina. North Carolina. North Carolina. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in Virginia, the only banned species, there's currently nine banned species, and there's run through the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So there's a very short list of plants, and they, it's controlled as originally they were agricultural pests. And they finally, get, a few years ago, got purple loosestrife listed. That was the ninth plant. But unfortunately, the process of listing plants in Virginia is very difficult. It has a lot to do with horticultural industry and whether or not they can make money off of it. Bradford pear is still being sold successfully. So in Virginia, it's listed by the Department of Conservation and Recreation as an invasive species on their list, but it's not prohibited for sale or use. So that's how it works in Virginia. Now in Fairfax, if you're building a new property or rebuilding and you have to have a site plan, you cannot include Bradford pear in your site plan. You can't plant it as part of your Plant required planting. So at least at the local level, there are some restrictions discouraging it and encouraging other other species. So, but anyway, so these, yeah, these out of these areas like this. The other thing that's important is you're blending into them. So, I think here it's probably gotten away from them a bit because it's a it's a big campus to maintain. And it's not cheap, but you want to try to eliminate these invasives as a minimum, and if you can, begin to add more natives into these zones. 
especially maybe tough natives that can really hold their own, you know. Uh, and, and you know, there's some probably get some, some good suggestions on the Plant Nova Natives website on these tough natives that will go in there. Uh, there's also in the sunny areas really tough natives that can compete. Um, for instance, if you're trying to take over a lawn area, it turns out that goldenrods are somewhat allelopathic to turf grasses. And they grow really well with broom sedge. And the two of them, although they're not the most, goldenrods are pretty, broom sedge for a lot of people isn't the most showy plant, but at the same time they, they can help reclaim that area and establish that native foothold. So if you want to just slowly take it over, you can begin to add those species in. I wanted to stop real briefly here. We're transitioning into, you can see where you got the parking lot area, you've got some of the plantings up front. And back here, you've got some natives mixed in, but then you um, have things like periwinkle or vinca popping up. The nice thing about vinca is it's not one of your worst invasives, although it's in the invasives book that you guys have. It's also, it's, it doesn't move very quickly. And, it, and you know, I don't know about the control factor, um, but it's, I think it could be your worst thing if that's what you've got, but it's not one of the worst usually. But the good news is if it's in a patch this size, there you can control it. So that's another message is if you see something that's a negative plant, get it early. The smaller the quantity you have to control, the better, the better able you are to control it the more easily. Um, and then when you get into this transition zone, you can see all the invasives that are going into the edge of this wood line. As they develop this property along the ledge of, edge of Lake Fairfax Park, you've opened up the forest edge to tremendous amounts of, of soil disturbance and light. Plus now you're getting the seed rain, mostly from birds and some from wind, of all the invasive seed landing in this edge area where they can just really thrive. So you have to watch those disturbed edges because they tend to be zones where you have a lot of invasives and they're gonna be zones where the battles might be tougher, but they're also really good places. Edge areas are really important habitat. A lot of the animals you wanna attract are gonna thrive in that transition zone between your open areas and your more forested areas. So they're really good areas to try to target to eliminate invasives and add shrubs and, and layers in. One of the things I would suggest, um, so adding a water feature, this one clearly is holding water, that's good. It's, it's in an area where it could have access for wildlife, that's also good. It's got a lot of leaf pack in it, which isn't necessarily bad, but I've also had water features in my yard before. Um, you'll find that you have to kind of manage them, especially if they get heavily clogged with leaf litter. Over time, they'll have less of a quality for wildlife. So I had an old liner. I had a rain barrel with a liner below it. So I would overflow the rain barrel, go into the liner, and overflow into a rock area. And I found that for the years I was managing it, I would have a lot of leaf accumulation. And, and one of the, a couple problems with leaf accumulation is it diminishes the amount of water, but it also raises the tannin levels. So you have to kind of, you want to try to thin that out a little bit. And the good news is when it rains, it cycles that water. But you'll find that in a place like this, the gray tree frogs will readily come in to a, a, a feature like this because they're highly adaptive, uh, most of the copes gray tree frogs. And they will come in from a forest edge. Uh, occasionally you'll get spring peepers in the area this high up. You'll also get pickerel frogs. Uh, the wood frogs are a little bit you know, they, they establish themselves in pools and the adults do live in the woods. So a lot of the frogs are moving from woodlands in uh, and, and green frogs are highly adaptive. So you can have a number of different frog species that will use these. You also have a lot of insects. So you will end up getting mosquitoes quite often. And something you might want to talk to people about is they want to have a water feature. They can use the little donuts. The donuts are BT, so it's Bacillia thuringiensis, I think it is. It's a naturally occurring bacteria that's in soil. It's the same stuff they've used for years to spray for gypsy moth and other things. But the difference is you're just targeting the pool. So it does kill other invertebrates in your pool. So if you, but you're not usually gonna attract a lot of odinates like dragonflies and things. If you are, you don't wanna put the donuts in there. So if you have a, a area a little bit further from the house with a really nice pool that's gonna attract dragonflies and things, don't put the donuts in because you'll kill the dragonflies. But the good news is if you have dragonflies in there, they're also eating a lot of the other invertebrates. So it's a big trade-off. Uh -huh. So if you were going to, I have a rain garden which also attracts a lot of weeds. And if you are going to pull the weeds out, when is a good time of year to do that when you won't disrupt the frogs? You want to do it before, um, so when the leaves are falling, before it gets really, really cold, or wait and do it in the spring after the water warms up and the frogs are active. 
just don't do it during the middle of the winter time. So um, you want to always try to minimize disturbance to any ectotherm, whether it's a, a, a reptile or an amphibian, once they start to go dormant until after they wake up. Okay. Yeah. And what's nice is that the, the breeding time, so for instance, you know, the early breeders are spring peepers and you'll get wood frogs are really early. Um, and then you'll, but you, later you'll get the American toads. You'll get uh, pickerel frogs are kind of in between, but toads are like May, so they're a little bit later. And then Cope's Cray tree frogs are even later than that. They'll drop them in as late as June. Yes. Now the flip side is, if you were actually in a quality woodland and you had things like wood frogs, they'd already been in there and, and maybe either still be there or they already be getting out. Because I saw wood frogs active over a month ago when we were getting warm weather. So February, they can go February if it's warm weather. What's that? You had toads trilling, huh? Excellent. And they're, it's all temperature driven. They get very keyed. But the other thing, of course, is by a water feature, so many things come in and out. And if you put a trail cam on this thing, you would catch the bigger stuff. But you also likely have here mics that are coming to it. Um, Long-tailed weasels are probably here. They're just very secretive. And they hunt everything imaginable, and they probably come in to drink. Um, you know, birds will be coming down probably pretty constantly to drink. So these water features can be really helpful. And you can pull in a lot of things like migrating warblers and things that you'll get to see by having a water feature where you can observe it. Even with the cannon in here, the water is different. They'll still drink it, but I would say that it would be better off if you had less leaf pack. Yeah. If this had more clear water, you'd be better off. And it will be better water through the summer. Yeah. So these features can be great, and it's also nice if they can capture a roof runoff. So that the whole connection to stormwater. So if they have a rain barrel, you maybe you pair that with a small pond. Uh, it's really nice to get that connection where you can capture that water. And then, then you know too it's clean water. And the nice thing too is if you have a rain barrel, you can repurpose that to, to water your plants. So that's a really good way to go. And then of course, I know this is kind of an extreme example, but downed wood, always a good thing. <laughs> Leave your logs if you can. That pile of rocks up there is probably left over from construction of the building. Uh, good rock piles are wonderful for wildlife. Um, when you're thinking about uh, your, your um, reptiles, they are seeking places in the wintertime where they won't freeze. So box turtles tend to dig into leaf litter and try to get down as deep as they can. Snakes and lizards are seeking places where they can get in contact with the ground so that their body temperature will not actually freeze. The closer they get to the ground, the ground temperature is pretty constant. So around here, they're trying to get into a crevice that's down deeper, like an old root system or a rock pile. And the nice thing about rock piles is in the wintertime, they heat up when the sun's on them. So they actually keep the, the temperature within that little zone higher than, than the surrounding air. It's pretty nice. So I know that um, a couple things that I think would be nice to talk about here. Maybe wait till everybody comes down. May you hear that? So does anybody know what that call sounds like? That, tira, tira, tira. Yeah, it sounds like red-shouldered hawk, but in this case, it's a blue jay, yeah. and they they mimic red shoulders all the time. And you heard it, it; it only went three times, and then it stopped, and then you heard a blue jay call. So, and the the rule of thumb I learned was if it's less than five, it's t it's almost always a blue jay. If it's more than five, it, it could be a red red-shouldered hawk. So, um, so this area right here, first of all, is great to stop in the sun. Yeah. But um, so thinking about this hillside, in urban landscapes, we often have homes that are built into slopes or have slope associated with the house. Um, if they build a wall, if they can, a couple things. One is allow stuff to grow on and around the wall if they can. They may not want trees growing because that might break their wall down. But they can get trees back from the wall. But let things cascade over it. Let mosses grow on it. Um, and that could be a really cool thing in terms of their yard, but also provide habitat because uh, a lot of things will use that wall over time. If they're able to leave some of that rock unmortared, that provides crevices for wildlife. And again, if it heats up, you'll get lizards that really like those, those walls, all the nooks and crannies. Your smaller snakes 
uh, will use garden stones. Mm -hmm. Invariably, if you go out and you find stones in the garden, you'll flip them over and you'll find uh, brown snakes, ring net snakes, worm snakes. You know, those little tiny guys that are totally harmless and they're, they're out there eating all the invertebrates in the, in the garden. So having periodic rock features or if they have a wall with have unordered backing where they can is all really helpful for attracting wildlife. And having that nice sun, even mammals and birds will use this sunny area that's out of the, out of the wind to bask and just to catch up some extra heat. Yeah. Um, another thing I'll point out with this slope. So one of the groups I help with is the Soil and Water Conservation District has their their conservation assistance program. It's their, their grant funded program where they help pr uh, private property owners pay for conservation landscaping. So it's exactly in line with what you guys are doing. And you probably are interact with that program where you may suggest that they apply for a grant, for instance. One of the most common things we see in their applications is a graded slope where they, they either it's down from the house or going up from the house. They compacted all the soil they keep taking their leaves off of it. They don't let the leaves lay, and they get erosion over time. So they're coming back for a conservation um, assistance program grant to plant it. And what often is the solution is a couple things. It is breaking that slope up so they might put in coir logs, like those biodegradable logs, or you could use natural wood, but also just the power of leaving the leaves. The more they remove that organic debris and they, they leave that soil open, and they don't let plants grow in there, the more erosion they're likely to get. So maybe part of it is you're helping them find a solution for an existing problem. If they have an erosive slope, putting their, their uh, maybe they grind their leaves up with their mower, keep those leaves on site. Put them on that slope area, try to get plants growing, and, and get it stabilized with root mass. It will help with the conservation landscaping and the, and the wildlife component, but it'll also help them with their slope stability problem. I think it's a really good one. You just want to get, you want to armor it first and get roots in it second, or some version thereof. I think it's a very helpful thing. Um, also, so you again, would leave this. If you, if, let, let's say this was a client's slope. Yeah. You've got a lot of leaves here. Yes. Leave it. Yes, leave the leaves and introduce more plants. And since you have this wonderful sunny slope, what an opportunity! There are so many cool native plants that grow in in, in uh, poor soils on slopes. You know, Maryland golden asters. That's one of the coolest summer, late summer plants. You can get all kinds of your grasses will grow in here. Like the purple muley grass that Margaret was talking about. This is a great, well-drained. It's, uh, it's um, you know, you can, you can get the soil moisture up over time, but get look for those plants that like, uh, like sunny conditions. They can handle like uh, hot later summers, uh, goldenrods, things like that. Those kind of drier field plants would just thrive on this side slope. So to me, it's an opportunity area. It helps them uh, find a solution, and it brings a really cool um, you know, component to their garden. And if you like snakes, that's where the snakes are going to sun themselves. So, um, so I think it's a really good thing. And then you can selectively weed out your, your invasives. Uh, did you guys notice the tree that's coming up here, these two trees? Sassafras. So sassafras, right, sassafras, they don't uh, transplant well. But they're a wonderful native plant, um, and they are clonal, so they will actually, once you have one, they'll send up, the more will grow from the root system. So that, and this is another good area for um, uh, staghorn or sumac, either staghorn sumac, smooth sumac, or winged sumac. All of those are wonderful native clonal species that grow in harsh conditions, like you see them on VDOT right away all the time, and they can really handle it, and they're really good natives. And they'll start rebuilding that soil compound and provide really good habitat benefits, plus great fall color. What if this was in the shade? In the shade, it's funny, we passed by the Aurelia back there, which is a devil's walking stick. Yeah. That's actually a great shade plant. Now, it usually likes higher soil moisture, but think about on a side slope in the shade, depends on how dry it is, blueberries. So think about your ericaceous shrubs. Highbush blueberry is one of the, the plants the deer kill the most around here and they're very hard to grow over time. Um, a shady, dry soil, like acidic soil, is a great high bush blueberry area. It's also one of the few places that mountain laurel will thrive. Uh, Calmia latifolia. A lot of places people try to plant it is in full sun. It's a, it's a forest plant. So it likes a dry condition, an acid soil, 
So any of your blueberries, your huckleberries, um, those ericaceous shrubs, if it's got some moisture to it, you could also get, um, think about um, uh, Lindera, like what's the common name? Spice, um, spice bush. bush, yeah. So spice bush is another great forest plant, understory. Uh, and then your viburnum, so maple leaf viburnum, um, arrowwood viburnum. Oh yeah, maple leaf viburnum is, is if you have good soil, or if you have any, well any shaded place in Fairfax County, any forested system, you could potentially have it. It doesn't like super dry acid conditions, as long as you have a decent soil moisture, um, it, it'll it'll be there. And it's usually a, a very dominant understory shrub. It's, it's just the deer whack it, so you have to just be careful about that. Arrowwood viburnum, same thing, uh, and then blackhaw viburnum. Okay. Now arrowwood in the natural condition tends to be more of a wetland plant, but in uh, in a in a gardening condition, you can grow it on any slope. Cool. But they're very shade tolerant. Yeah. Did you so, eat all of those? I'm sorry, what? Did, did your father all of those? Not all of them. And I think the other thing to think about with deer, so for instance, um, you can pick and choose. So they don't they don't prefer spice bush. So if you're going to plant spice, maybe what you do is you plant your spice bush first, and then once your spice bush is established, you plant between the spice bush with some of the things they kind of like better. So they'll tend to move around it, and we're experimenting that with restoration planting right now, and it's, and it's actually good evidence that it does work. You can actually diminish the browse on preferred plants by having non-preferred plants on the outer side of your planting area. So that's something to, to consider. And then they don't like your graminoids, so your grasses. Most of your field plants are not deer preferred because they grew up with grazers are browsers, they're broadleaf plants that, uh, that are grown in the fields, and deer are browsers, but they have, they have better chemical defenses. So they co-evolved with deer, and they have the chemistry to prevent that over-browse much better from constant uh, eating by animals. As where woody plants, they evolved with a lower browse density because they were predators present, so they aren't, don't have the same chemical defenses against the, the high densities. Here you've got behind you an intact forest stand. It has its problems, but the primary stressor is deer browse. You're looking out into a very disturbed edge. So what you want to try to do is think about how to blend this intact forest stand with your disturbed area and minimize the invasives and maximize kind of that, fill that edge with natives. If you can get more layers in there, that creates a much better transition a lot of habitat on those transition uh, zones and the edges. It's a lot of animals spend a lot of time there. Plus things like cowbirds ultimately, one of the things they do is they can, when you have this open edge, they follow that bird into the woodland and they can see where it nests. But the more, the shrubbier this zone, the more animals can disappear to the edge and the less success something like a cowbird would have in following them in. The other thing is you have a lot of predation on these edges from cats, from raccoons, Raccoons go in and eat a lot of birds too, and there are much higher densities in this edge area. So remember, you've got high predation. And, um, but the cool thing is you're so close, here you'll get interior forest dwelling birds like your wood thrushes, like your oven birds, like your um, scarlet tanagers. Here they actually have an opportunity to thrive because there's, it's far enough in. The rule of thumb is usually after about 300 feet or so, the effects of the edge habitat diminish. So you have to have, usually they say at least 100 acres uh, and a decent block to have really good interior forest um, capacity. And this is, this is a big area, so this would be, so this is a big advantage, I think. It could be a small natural remnant. It could be the corner of two yards coming together with three oak trees in a cluster. And a square foot area, not much bigger than that, walk sticking into the yard you're working with, but that's something to build off of, you know. The other thing I was going to point out here is that you know, monarch butterflies are unique in that they rely primarily on one host plant to, to uh, take care of three life cycle stages when they're moving. So it's egg, larva, and pupa are all on milkweeds, and the adults will forage on whatever they can find for nectar. But most of our butterflies and moths are forest, are forest uh, dwellers for the egg, larva, and pupal stage. They're only out in the open during their adult stage. So in order to keep our butterflies, we need woodlands. They're going to eat the leaves of the trees uh, during their larval stage. 
they will usually pupate in the woods, often in leaf litter. So intact leaf litter is critical, along with that woody debris on the ground. And some um, butterflies actually overwinter as adults in woody debris in woodlands. Hmm. But that's why it's critical to have that mosaic. You need to have woodlands and open areas and those transition zones in order to support as much wildlife as you can. But you're saying a woodland can be as something as small as three trees. Yeah, you won't get all the same functions, but right. every bit helps. Some. Yep, and you'll get, and, and I think another, this is another Doug Tallamy thing, because he has so much research between him and the other people working with him. They've, they're looking at, um, just a tree in the landscape, a single yeah. oak by itself, and how many caterpillars you can get off of a, a small oak versus a non-native tree, and there and there's tremendous differences in the numbers, not only the species count, but the, the total count. Uh, and again, as Betsy quoted, that say, that one pair of chickadees getting four to 600 caterpillars a day, mm -hmm. right. that's a lot of foraging, <laughs> um, you think about it. That's a lot of work. For the oak. <laughs> and the farther they have to go, the less successful they're gonna be. They're just gonna burn out. Right. So um, the more trees you have, the better off you are. But yeah, every bit helps, every bit. And remember, the shrubs help too. So, you know, spice bush, it has its own uh, organisms that are specific right. to it. Spice bush swallowtail. Yep, spice bush yeah. swallowtail. And so you need, you need that variety of as many things as you can get in, the better off you are. And try, if you can build off nearby structure, it doesn't have to be that your, your butterflies aren't necessarily, they aren't gonna necessarily use the little remnant right on that property. It yeah. might be a, a block away right. to a, an HOA parcel or a, you know, another private parcel or a piece of parkland that's got all the big trees on it. That's that okay. That's the beauty of being able to do an HOA. Yeah. Because you have so much variety. But the more variety. they are able to provide that woody plant cover with the intact uh, f uh, you know, leaf litter and yeah. woody debris, the more animals will be able to stay there and complete their life cycle on that property. So that's the beauty of it, you know. Everybody helps, but the more they have, the more they can get. Well, how do we convince people not to m remove their leaves? You know, I mean, there's such a program. Everybody comes around, and sucks up all the leaves, and uh, what? Yeah. How, how do we say to them, leave it? Well, once. Um, so I think to me is that. So for instance, if they're going to mulch anyway, if they mulch their leaves up and add those as the as their mulch layer, now they haven't imported mulch. Yeah. And they use their leaves, which is going to be better for the plants anyway. So just use their the, use that as a resource. Um, they could also compost their leaf pile. So if they don't want to spread it out in one place, they could find one place to put all their leaves in the back, for instance. And over time, the the soil that develops uh, from the bottom of that, oh my gosh, at the bottom of a big leaf pile over years, yeah, you get the most so beautiful, rich, organic soil that you can put back in your gardens. Yeah. It's incredible. What you want to be careful about is piling the leaves up within a woodland so it's so thick you suppress the, the native plants. Yeah, so that's that's a bit difficult. Have a space or I had a sacrifice zone at my last yard. Okay. The areas that I wanted to have leaves off of, I would grind them up and put them in one spot. Okay. That I would put them on top of tree limbs and things. That ended up being kind of a um, an area where uh, animals could actually dig into mm -hmm. and actually find uh, warmth. So it was, it was potentially a hibernacula. So you know, I think this just pick a small zone or grind them up and use them as mulch on their on their beds. I think is a great way to go. If you look at the trees that are dying with that snag there, or on this tulip tree that's still alive, there's actually woodpeckers are carving out holes up in there, and that, that's tremendous habitat. So there's a lot of things that use them. Mice actually nest in trees a lot. Um, there are um, broadhead skinks that are the, you know, they're the, the really most arboreal lizard we have. Uh, of course, snakes, black rat snakes climb trees, and of course we have birds, a lot of birds and insects. So. Those spaces, those crevices, are really important spaces inside trees. They can leave any standing wood, and maybe what you convince them is if they have something that's dying, if they're willing to top it and leave a smaller snag, something that's not going to be dangerous when it falls. I guess just coming back out of the woods, back into the campus, I mean, these, these zones, these areas, in terms of cover, this zone has good structure in terms of cover, but it's just that if you can convert most of this from the invasives over to the natives as best you can. And you know, you might think about if somebody wants to, and they've got a really cruddy kind of an area like this that doesn't have many natives, you might convince them to get uh, somebody in to bush hog it all down, mm. and start and start by planting a meadow, and then have your have your uh, woody plants concentrated in little clumps. The reason I say that is if you have a bad invasive problem, mowing is your cheapest option. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it's a lot cheaper to mow and easier to mow because almost everybody can do it. But if you plant woody plants in there, then you're going to have to hand control mm -hmm. or use herbicide on your invasives. So think about that if a property owner has enough room. Think about mowing as a, as a management tool. And you can go several years where you mow it a couple times a year and still get natives established over time, but you want to exhaust that invasive seed bed and slowly get those natives going.